Fireside Christmas Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fireside Christmas Short Stories by Various. Christmas, Chapter 8 of Wilderness, A Journal of Quiet Adventure in Alaska by Rockwell Kent. Recording by David Wales. Thursday, December 19th this day is never to be forgotten so beautiful so calm so still with the earth and every branch and tree muffled in deep feathery new-fallen snow and all day the softest clouds have drifted lazily over the heaven shrouding the land here and there in veils of falling snow while elsewhere or through the snow itself the sun shone golden shadows dazzling peaks fairy tracery of branches against the blue summer sea it was a day to live and work could be forgotten so rockwell and i explored the woods at first reverently treading one path that the snow about us might still lie undisturbed but soon the cub in the boy broke out and he rolled in the deepest thickets shook the trees down upon himself lay still in the snow for me to cover him completely washed his face till it was crimson and wound up with a naked snow bath i photographed him standing thus in the deep snow at the water's edge with the mountains far off behind him then he dried himself at the roaring fire we'd made ready and felt like a new boy if that can be imagined we both sketched out of doors for a little while in the morning like young lady amateurs I tried it again two or three times throughout the day with indifferent results. It was too beautiful. We cut wood, too, and that went with a zest. While Rockwell dried himself after his bath, I searched in the woods for a Christmas tree and cut a fair-sized one at last for its top. Christmas is right upon us now. Tonight the cranberries stew on the stove. Friday, December 20th. The beautiful snow is fast going under the falling rain. With only five more days before Christmas, it is probable we'll have little, if any, snow on the ground then. A snowless Christmas in Alaska! This day was as uneventful as could be. Part of the morning was consumed in putting a new handle into the sledgehammer. It was too dark to paint long, really hardly an hour of daylight. These days slip by so easily and with so little accomplished. Only by burning midnight oil can much be done. Sunday, December 22nd. Both yesterday and today it has poured rain. They've not been unpleasant days, however. Occasional let-ups have allowed us to cut wood and get water without inconvenience. This morning Olson, fearing that a continuance of the mild weather would melt the ice in the lake and send his bags of fish to the bottom, went out to the center of the lake where they hung suspended through a hole in the ice and brought them in. But so precarious has the ice become that he carried a rope and took me along in case of trouble. To get out upon the ice we had to go some distance along the lake's shore. Returning, we missed meeting Rockwell, who had gone to join us. Not for some time did it occur to me to call him. It was well I did call. The poor boy, on not seeing us, had suddenly concluded we were drowned. A strip of water separated him from the ice. He was on the point of wading into this at the moment I called him. He was still terribly excited when he reached us. Both days I have been occupied with humble, housewifely duties baking, washing, mending, and now the cabin is adorned with our drying clothes. Here, where water must be carried so far, it is the wet days that are wash days. Darning is a wretched nuisance. We should have socks enough to tide us over our stay here. Last night, after Rockwell had been put to bed, I sat down and did two of the best drawings I have done. At half-past twelve I finished them, and then to calm my elation a bit for sleep, read in the Odyssey. At this, my second reading of the book, it's as intensely interesting, or more so, than ever. As a story, it is incomparably better than the Iliad. To me, it is full of suggestions for wonderful pictures. 
Ten days from now it comes due for Olson to go to Seward. If only then we have mild calm weather. But as yet we have seen no steamer go to Seward since early in the month. It looks as if the steamship companies had combined to deprive Alaska of its Christmas mail and freight in a policy of making the deadlock with the government over the mail contracts intolerable. Meanwhile, instead of serving us, the jaunty little naval cruisers that summered here in idleness doubtless loaf away the winter months in comfortable southern ports. Monday, December 23rd. Up to this morning the hard, warm rain continued, and now the stars are all out, and it might be thought a night in spring. At 8.30 I walked over in sneakers and underwear for a moment's call on Olson, but he had gone to bed. And now, although we'll have no snow, the weather is fair for Christmas. If Olson believes, as he says, that Christmas will pass as any other day, he is quite wrong. The tree waits to be set up, and it will surely be a thing of beauty, blazing with its many candles in this somber log interior. I've given up the idea of dressing Olson as Santa Claus in goat's wool whiskers. Santa Claus, without presents, would move us to tears. There are a few little gifts, a pocket knife and a kitchen set of knife, fork, and can opener for Olson, an old broken fountain pen for Rockwell, some sticks of candy, and the dinner. What shall it be? Wait. It is midnight. I've just finished a good drawing. The lamp is about at its accustomed low mark. Yesterday it had to be filled twice. Those nights, when without a clock I sat up so late and to so uncertain an hour, I have discovered by the lamp and clock together to have been really long. My bedtime then was after two or three o'clock, but I arose later. Today I finished a little picture for Olson, and so did Rockwell. These were forgotten in my list of presents as I've just written it. I have shown in my picture the king of the island himself striding out to feed the goats, while Billy, rearing on his hind legs, tries to steal the food on the way. Rockwell's picture is of Olson, surrounded by all the goats in a more peaceful mood. Olson's cabin is in the background. I wish we had more to give the good old man. At any rate, he dines with us. Christmas Eve We've cleaned the house, stowed everything away upon shelves and hooks and in corners, moved even my easel aside, decorated the roof timbers with dense hemlock boughs, stowed quantities of wood behind the stove, for there must be no work on that holiday, and now both Rockwell and I are in a state of suppressed excitement over tomorrow. What a strange thing! Nothing is coming to us, no change in any respect in all the routine of our lives but what we make ourselves, and yet the day looms so large and magnificent before us. I suppose the greatest festivals of our lives are those at which we dance ourselves. You need nothing from outside, not even illusion. Certainly children need to be given scarcely an idea to develop out of it an atmosphere of mystery and expectation as real and thrilling to themselves as if it rested upon true belief. Well, the tree is ready, cut to length with a cross at the foot to stand upon, and a cardboard and tinfoil star to hang at its top. And now as to Christmas weather. This morning, as might just as well have been expected, was again overcast. Toward evening light snow began to fall. It soon turned to rain, and the rain now has settled down to a gentle, even, all-night-and-day pace. Let it snow or rain, and grow dark at midday. The better shall be our good Christmas cheer within. This is the true Christmas land. The day should be dark the house further overshadowed by the woods, tall and black, and there, in the midst of that sombre, dreadful gloom, the Christmas tree should blaze in glory unrivaled by moon or sun or star. Christmas Day on Fox Island It is mild, the ground is almost bare, and a warm rain falls. 
First the Christmas tree, all dripping wet, is brought into the house and set upon its feet. It is nine feet and a half high and just touches the peak of the cabin. There it stands and dries its leaves while Rockwell and I prepare the feast. Both stoves are kept burning and the open door lets in the cool air. Everything goes beautifully. The wood burns as it should, the oven heats, the kettle boils, the beans stew, the bread browns in the oven just right, and the new pudding sauce foams up as rich and delicious as if instead of the first it were the hundredth time I've made it. And now everything is ready. The clock stands at a quarter to three. Night has about fallen, and lamp light is in the cabin. Run, Rockwell, out of doors and play a while. Quickly I stow the presents about the tree, hang sticks of candy from it, and light the candles. Rockwell runs for Mr. Olson, and just as they approach the cabin, the door opens and Fairyland is revealed to them. It is wonderful. The interior of the cabin is illuminated as never before, as perhaps no cabin interior ever was among these wild mountains. Then, all amazed and wondering, these two children come in. Who knows which is the more entranced? Then Olson and I drink in deep solemnity a silent toast, and the old man says, I'd give everything, yes, everything I have in the world, to have your wife here now. And the presents are handed out. For Olson, this picture from Rockwell. Ah, he thinks it's wonderful. Then, for Rockwell, this book, a surprise from Seward. Next, for Olson, a painting, a kitchen set, and a pocket knife. By this time he's quite overcome. It's the first Christmas he has ever had. And Rockwell, when he is handed two old copies of the Geographic magazine, cries in amazement, Why, I thought I was to have no presents. But he gets besides a pocket knife and the broken fountain pen, and sits on the bed looking at the things as if they were the most wonderful of gifts. Dinner is now set upon the table. Olson adjusts his glasses and reads the formal menu that lies at his place. So we feast and have a jolly good time. Menu, Fox Island Christmas, 1918 Hors d'oeuvres, olives, pickles Entrees, spaghetti a la Fox Island Roti, beans a la Resurrection Bay Murphy's en casserole Cranberry sauce Dessert, plum pudding magnifique, sauce a la Alaskan rum, demitasse, nuts, raisins, bonbons, home sweet home cider, music by the German band. It is a true party, and looks like one. Rockwell and I are in clean white shirts, Olson is magnificent in a new flannel shirt, and his Sunday trousers and waistcoat. He wears a silk tie, and in it a gold nugget pin. He is shaven and clipped about the ears. How grand he looks! The food is good and plentiful, the night is long, only the Christmas candles are short-lived and we extinguish them to save them for another time. Finally, as the night deepens, Olson leaves us amid mutual expressions of delight in each other's friendship and Rockwell and I tumble into bed. End of Christmas, Chapter 8 of Wilderness, A Journal of Quiet Adventure in Alaska by Rockwell Kent.